The tranquility of a small American town was shattered by a tragic incident. A young girl vanished without a trace from her own residence, leaving behind her personal items, phone and car. As time passed, the investigation of this case started to resemble a typical crime series, with the exception that it was all unfolding in reality. The community was engulfed in an atmosphere of fear and suspicion, because any of the residents could have been involved in the girl's disappearance. It was only after twelve years that the chilling truth was revealed to the entire world. Tara Grinstead, born in 1974 in Hawkinsville, USA, was an active participant in beauty pageants during her high school years, where she won several accolades. From a young age, she aspired to receive a quality education, saving the money earned from competitions to fund her studies. Following college, Tara obtained a master's degree in education and secured her dream job as a high school history teacher in Oshila, Georgia. This small town epitomized quintessential America, with a population of around 4,000 individuals who were well acquainted with one another. Life was serene and predictable, with no one suspecting the occurrence of any major crimes in Oshila. Tara had been teaching at the local school for a number of years, forming strong bonds with both colleagues and students. She was known for her kindness, sociability, and unwavering supportiveness. In October 2005, Tara's assistance was invaluable to her students who were gearing up for a local beauty pageant. Given her past successes in similar competitions, the girls were elated to have her guidance. On the evening of Saturday, October 22nd, Tara aided the students with final preparations before the pageant. Subsequently, she attended a picnic with her high school friends and returned home around 11 p.m., parking her car outside beneath a carport. Following that night, Tara ceased all communication, causing great concern for her mother, who resided in another city. Her daughter was always prompt in answering the phone or returning calls, but this time there was silence on the other end. On Monday, October 24th, her anxiety peaked when Tara failed to show up for work. This was completely out of character for her. She was dedicated to her job and would have definitely informed her superiors if she needed time off. Concerned friends of Tara reached out to police chief Billy Hancock, asking him to check on her well-being. At 10 a.m. that morning, he arrived at her residence, assuming her phone was dead and she was either unwell or had overslept. Tara's car was parked in its usual spot, with unlocked doors, not uncommon in a small town like this where theft was rare. A hundred-dollar bill in an envelope on the dashboard caught Billy's attention. It was odd for someone as responsible as Tara to leave money out in the open. Knocking on the door yielded no response, prompting him to search the house. Everything seemed normal until he reached Tara's bedroom, which was in disarray, a stark contrast to her usual neatness. Her belongings were scattered on the floor, including the outfit she was last seen in. Her cell phone was charging on the nightstand, indicating she had left briefly, but was now missing. Outside, a latex glove was discovered, hinting at a potential crime scene. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the state-level equivalent of the Federal Bureau Investigation, was brought in to assist, escalating the case to a higher level of scrutiny. The primary focus of the investigation centered around the kidnapping. Very little evidence was found apart from the glove. Detectives came across only two suspicious items, Tara's broken chain on the bedroom floor and her missing alarm clock. Despite these clues, the mystery of her disappearance remained unsolved. This Monday was a dreadful day for the small town. Tara's residence was sealed off, and the school held a meeting. Tara's colleagues and students rallied together to aid in the search, forming a volunteer group. They distributed numerous flyers bearing Tara's image and details of her vanishing, which were promptly displayed all over the city. The volunteers dedicated their day until 1 a.m. to the cause. Bureau of Investigation agents interviewed Tara's neighbors and combed through her neighborhood. Sniffer dogs were brought in to trace the missing person's scent, Investigators clung to the hope that Tara had left on foot and would be easily located by the dogs. 
The latex glove was handed over to experts, who aimed to extract as much information as possible. They managed to obtain a DNA sample, but no matches were found in the FBI database. The only certainty was that the sample belonged to a male. Unfortunately, all efforts proved futile. Tara seemed to have vanished into thin air from her own apartment. Subsequently, investigators delved into Tara's personal history and relationships. It is often the case that someone close to the missing person is involved. After scrutinizing Tara's former partner, Marcus Harper, a retired police officer and military personnel, detectives failed to pinpoint any suspects. Tara had been in a long-term relationship with Marcus, but they parted ways at her behest approximately a year prior to her disappearance. The split occurred due to Tara's desire to start a family, a prospect Marcus was not prepared for. Following the separation, they maintained a cordial relationship, conversing and messaging each other. Detectives later discovered a fascinating detail. Marcus had arrived in Osilla three weeks before Tara vanished, yet he neglected to inform her. Upon hearing of Marcus's visit from mutual acquaintances, the woman grew deeply distressed. She persistently contacted him, seeking an explanation for his silence. Tara's distress escalated into genuine hysteria. Her family grew increasingly concerned, pondering if Tara would act recklessly. Nevertheless, the young woman soon regained composure, and the authorities did not view Marcus as a suspect. The couple had a lengthy history together, but their romance ended, leaving detectives puzzled by the lack of a motive for the crime. A surprising turn of events awaited them. It was revealed that Tara had been threatened by a former student on March 30, 2005, seven months before her disappearance. The student had visited her home and displayed aggressive behavior. When Tara refused to allow him entry, he began banging on the door, prompting neighbors to contact law enforcement. It emerged that the young man had harbored feelings for the teacher since high school. According to acquaintances, the former student exhibited emotional instability and peculiar, even alarming behavior. Tara attempted to assist him with his issues for a period, but his mental state deteriorated further. Following the incident where he attempted to break into her home, Tara filed a report against him, fearing for her safety. After Tara vanished, authorities located the young man, who worked in a town approximately 150 kilometers from Osilla. The young man provided detectives with an alibi for the nights surrounding his former teacher's disappearance. His involvement in the case could not be established. Additionally, a business card belonging to a specific police officer was discovered in the woman's residence. Tara had been romantically involved with him for quite some time, but he had already relocated to a different city by the time of her disappearance. The officer even provided an alibi for the night Tara went missing, effectively eliminating any potential suspects. With no solid leads to follow, law enforcement made the decision to launch a search for the young woman two weeks after she vanished. The delayed action seemed peculiar, considering it was evident from the start that Tara did not leave willingly. Hundreds of volunteers were summoned to scour the vicinity near the cellar, they combed through forests, ditches, and rivers, yet not a single trace of Tara was found. During the search, news broke that a nearby house had mysteriously burned down. The locals were convinced that the incident was linked to Tara's disappearance. Speculations arose that the culprit was attempting to cover their tracks, or perhaps the community was so shaken that they viewed every occurrence with suspicion. Regardless, the search efforts proved fruitless, leaving the authorities at a loss. In the ensuing years, the case remained unsolved until 2009, when a shocking development brought Tara Grinstead's name back into the public eye. A YouTube channel emerged, featuring a chilling video with a masked man confessing to the disappearances of 16 girls, including Tara. He claimed to have hidden the bodies and promised to reveal their burial locations in subsequent videos. Upon investigation, Law enforcement confirmed that all 16 names matched those of missing women. The Federal Bureau of Investigation swiftly identified the video's creator as 27-year-old Andrew Haley. Following his apprehension, Haley insisted that it was all a joke. The authorities failed to link Andrew to any of the 16 missing girls, 
yet he could not escape a trial for perjury and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to two years of forced labor and thirteen years of probation. The fleeting hope of solving this cold case vanished, leaving the police once again without a single lead. In December 2010, Tara Grinstead was officially declared deceased due to lack of evidence. As time passed, the townspeople remembered Tara Grinstead's disappearance vividly, but spoke of it less and less. The shock of Tara's disappearance had a lasting impact on the community, instilling fear and mistrust for years to come. It wasn't until 2016 that something happened to reignite public interest in Tara's case. Atlanta-based journalist Payne Lindsay launched his own podcast dedicated to unsolved cases, and for the inaugural episode, he focused on the Tara Grinstead's case. Lindsay and his colleague traveled to Osceola, where they met private investigator Maurice Godwin. Together, they began working on the case, starting almost from scratch since they had no access to police records. Their only available source of information was the people of the town. Initially, they could only talk to friends and relatives of Tara. Outsiders avoided discussing the missing girl in every way. But Lindsay's enthusiasm managed to revive interest in the case, and soon the people of Osceola were discussing it again. Lindsay and Godwin pursued every possible lead, considering three potential suspects, Tara's ex-boyfriends and the student who attempted to break into her house. Along the way, they spoke to anyone who might have had valuable information. They were so dedicated to the case that, on several occasions, they believed a clue was just within reach. One day, Payne received a call from an anonymous individual who suggested they search for remains on Tara's property. The police did so, and eventually, they managed to find bones. Genuine specialists swiftly identified the bones as belonging to an animal. Despite the thrill and a fresh surge of interest in the case, no significant progress was achieved, or rather, the case remained unsolved directly during the production of the podcast. However, it was this amateur investigation that proved pivotal in the long-awaited breakthrough, the climax arrived entirely unexpectedly in early 2017. Brooke Sheridan approached the authorities with a startling narrative that reignited hope among detectives. She disclosed that her former partner, Bo Dukes, had once admitted to her that he assisted his friend in disposing of Tara Grinstead's remains. Upon hearing Brooke's account, law enforcement exercised caution. They instructed her to wear a wire and approach Bo to extract a confession. The plan succeeded. Bo did not refute his involvement, providing the police with probable cause for his arrest. To their astonishment, Bo readily cooperated with the inquiry and divulged all the details. Subsequently, investigators would remark that he was simply weary of bearing the weight on his conscience. Bo admitted that on that fateful night, he received a call from his friend and former schoolmate, Ryan Duke. Ryan requested the use of a truck to aid him with the task mentioning that he had broken into Tara Grinstead's residence to steal money. According to Ryan's version, following a gathering with friends, he embarked on a drive and decided to burglarize a home to acquire cash. His target was Tara's residence. He was under the influence of illicit substances at the time. After gaining entry with a credit card, he intruded into the house and commenced searching for money. Tara caught sight of him, leading to a confrontation between them, from which only Ryan emerged alive. Upon Bo's arrival at Tara's home in a truck, they loaded the woman's body into it and transported her to the woods. The pair then disposed of the body. For several days, this narrative left the inhabitants of Achilla in disbelief. Dukes and Duke were never considered suspects due to their lack of motive and absence of any clues linking them to the woman's disappearance. Despite a full confession, Bo Dukes refused to testify against himself in court. During the trial, he addressed Tara's family, shedding tears and expressing remorse for his actions. Bo, a decorated military veteran, was sentenced to 25 years in prison for his involvement in covering up the crime. The murder trial of Tara Grinstead, carried out by Ryan Duke, was initially scheduled for April 1, 2019. 
However, the Georgia Supreme Court postponed the trial on March 28, 2019, after Duke's legal team claimed they were unjustly denied funding for expert witnesses. The trial eventually commenced on May 9, 2022. Ryan Duke pleaded not guilty to murder and accused Bo Dukes of the crime. On May 20, 2022, the jury acquitted Ryan Duke of murder, but found him guilty of concealing the death. During the trial, Duke asserted that his earlier confessions were fabricated, attributing them to drug influence and fear of the actual perpetrator, his friend with a similar surname, Dukes. He claimed that Bo Dukes woke him up in their shared mobile home in 2005, confessing to Tara Grinstead's murder and displaying her belongings. Despite the absence of her body, forensic analysis matched Grinstead's DNA to bone fragments discovered at the site where Ryan Duke alleged he and Bo Dukes incinerated her remains. On May 23, 2022, Ryan Duke was sentenced to the maximum penalty of 10 years in prison for concealing the body by the Irwin County Superior Court. At the time of sentencing, Ryan Duke had already served approximately half of his sentence while awaiting trial. Prosecutors vehemently argued that Duke's admission contained intricate details known only to the perpetrator, such as Duke disclosing to authorities that he phoned Grinstead's residence from a payphone after absconding from home to check if she would pick up. Upon receiving no response, he retraced his steps only to discover her lifeless body. Furthermore, Investigators uncovered Duke's genetic material on a latex glove recovered from Grinstead's premises. Nevertheless, his testimony sowed enough skepticism in the jury's minds, resulting in his acquittal on all charges, save for concealing her demise. Bo Dukes was summoned to provide testimony, but opted to invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. When the truth surrounding this high-profile case finally surfaced, Tara Grinstead's loved ones and friends breathed a collective sigh of relief as the weight of uncertainty was lifted off their shoulders. Her mother tearfully admitted that throughout the years she had harbored a secret hope for a miracle, the return of her daughter, safe and sound. On November 28, 2003, Sherida Williams, a 16-year-old resident of Pensacon Township, New Jersey, decided to treat herself to a nail appointment after the Thanksgiving holiday. Around 5 o'clock p.m., she left her home, which was conveniently just a short five-minute walk away from the local salon where her best friend was eagerly waiting for her. Sherida assured her parents that she would return shortly, but as hours passed without any sign of her, her parents grew increasingly worried. In a state of panic, her mother began reaching out to Sherida's friends only to discover that even her best friend had not seen her that day. The disappearance of Sherita Williams left her loved ones questioning what could have possibly happened to her. Did she lose her way, or was there a more sinister reason behind her sudden vanishing? Pensacon Township, located in Camden County, New Jersey, is a suburban area neighboring Philadelphia along the Delaware River. As of the 2020 United States Census, the population of this township was approximately 37,000. Known for its significant industrial park, Pensacon houses major facilities such as a Pepsi bottling plant and the headquarters of J&J &J Snack Foods. The residents of Pensacon are known for their warm and welcoming nature, creating a peaceful community. However, it is worth noting that the crime rate in Pensacon in 2003 was higher than the national average, with 592 incidents per 100,000 people compared to the national rate of 478. Sherida Williams, a high school student, resided in Pensacon with her family. Born on October 1, 1987, she was the beloved daughter of Harry and Wilma Williams and grew up in a nurturing home alongside her sister, Sabrina, and brother, John Henry. Sherida possessed a keen eye for the arts, particularly photography, and had a deep passion for music and dance. Monday nights were cherished moments for the Williams family as they would come together to laugh, cry, and bond over the stories unfolding on the screen. Sherida actively participated in the youth group at Ashbury United Methodist Church in Pensacon, where she found an outlet for a strong sense of community and compassion. Sherida, a popular junior at Pensacon High School, 
possessed a deep fondness for children and eagerly embraced any opportunity to babysit for friends and relatives. Her playful nature and boundless energy endeared her to the children, who adored her in return. Sheridan's strong empathy and love for her community fueled her aspiration to become a social worker and help people in need. Known for her bright and magnetic personality, she approached life with unwavering trust in the goodness of others. Sherita eagerly anticipated attending college and leaving a lasting impact on the world. Despite her big dreams, she also found joy in the simple pleasures of life, such as getting her nails, hair, and eyebrows done. On November 20, 2003, at 5 o'clock p.m., Sherita left her home to visit a salon located just a short five-minute walk away. Her plan was to meet her best friend there. However, the events that unfolded would forever alter the lives of those who loved her. When Sherita failed to return home at the expected time, her mother, Wilma, contacted her friend and was shocked to learn that they hadn't met at the salon. This revelation unsettled Wilma as her motherly intuition sensed that something was amiss. As the night wore on, Sherida's parents clung to hope, anticipating her return, but she never came back. Unable to bear the weight any longer on November 29, 2003, Sherida's parents filed a missing person report. The Camden County Police swiftly initiated a search for Sherita in and around the salon and its vicinity. Meanwhile, her parents actively scarred the streets of Pensalkin in search of their beloved daughter. A phone call from one of Sherita's friends added to their unease, suggesting that she might be in the vicinity of 36th Street, a place she had expressed fear of passing through. Acting on this tip, Wilma and Harry promptly drove to the area, hoping to find any trace of Sherita. Shortly before 3 o'clock p.m., in the vicinity of a railroad bridge at the intersection of 36th Street and Hayes Avenue in Pensacan, Wilma made a distressing discovery. She noticed what appeared to be a person lying on the gravel without proper clothing. Her maternal instincts immediately kicked in, prompting her to contact the Camden County Prosecutor's Office. Detectives swiftly arrived at the scene and uncovered the truth beneath the bridge. It was a teenage girl who bore a striking resemblance to Sherita Williams. Adjacent to her was her purse, containing her identification, which confirmed her identity. Sherida was lying face up in the dirt, with her shirt torn open, pants unbuttoned, and hands bound behind her back. Although there were no visible injuries on her body, her undergarments had been forcibly removed, leaving red marks around her waist. The police had concerns that Sheridan may have been subjected to sexual assault. Adding to the distressing situation, a direct was found around her neck, suggesting it may have been used to silence her cries. Additionally, two plastic bags from a nearby sporting goods store were discovered lodged in her mouth. One of the bags contained a receipt for a black shirt purchased at 4.28 p.m. on the same day she went missing. The devastating news of Sherida's death deeply impacted Wilma and Harry's lives, as well as sending shockwaves throughout the community. As the police and concerned neighbors gathered around the Williams residence, those who knew Sherida expressed their grief. One neighbor described her as a kind-hearted individual who did not deserve such a fate. The Camden County Police officially classified Sherida's death as a homicide and initiated an investigation into the crime scene where she was found. It was determined that Sherida had been strangled and suffocated. Furthermore, there were indications of bodily fluid stains on her jeans, suggesting a sexual assault had taken place. Despite the absence of obvious physical trauma, no knives or bullets were discovered in close proximity. However, the police did uncover some peculiar items at the scene, including a man's hair cap and a penny believed to belong to the perpetrator. The hair cap was sent to the laboratory for analysis in hopes of finding hair strands and other potential evidence. In order to reconstruct Sheridan's final movements, investigators reviewed surveillance footage from the nail salon in Pensalkin that she frequently visited. The footage revealed that she was at the salon at 6.5 p.m., getting her eyebrows done. Subsequently, the detectives examined credit card receipts, interviewed customers of the salon, and questioned individuals who may have been present at the crime scene. Unfortunately, no significant breakthrough was made, and the identity of the killer remained elusive. The detectives became intrigued by how Wilma and Harry had known to search near the bridge. 
Wilma explained that while she was making calls to find Sherida, one of her friends had mentioned the 36th Street Bridge, stating that Sherida had expressed fear about crossing it. Harry believed that this friend might possess additional information about his daughter, prompting the detectives to focus on this new lead and approach Sherida's friend for an interview. The friend claimed that she had mentioned the 36th Street location to Wilma on a hunch, as Sherida sometimes took that route to visit her boyfriend. Additionally, the police discovered that Sherida had made a call to her boyfriend in Camden from a nearby payphone around 6.30 p.m., just before her disappearance. The police located the boyfriend and spoke to him in the presence of his mother. He confirmed that Sherida had visited him that night at around 6.30 p.m., but he had been asleep in his bedroom due to his night shift work as a security guard and had not seen her. His mother admitted to speaking to Sherida at the door, but not allowing her inside because she did not like her. Despite tagging the boyfriend as a suspect, the detectives lacked physical evidence linking him to the crime scene, and he also passed a lie detector test successfully. Eventually, he was cleared of suspicion. Following this setback, the detectives meticulously reevaluated the evidence, with a particular focus on the t-shirt receipt found in the plastic bag. It was determined that the receipt was from the Model Sports Goods store in the Sherry Hill Mall. However, upon their visit to the store, they encountered yet another obstacle. The surveillance cameras at the establishment had malfunctioned on the evening of November 28th, leaving no available footage. In light of this setback, the detectives decided to pursue a lead they had received as a tip. An unidentified individual claimed to have seen one of Sherida's male friends driving near the bridge on the night of the murder, suggesting that Sherida may have been in his car. Interestingly, this male friend happened to be dating one of Sherida's acquaintances, and rumors circulated that he had feelings for Sherida. Given that Sherida had used a payphone, investigators speculated that she may have called this friend for a ride, unaware of his romantic interest in her. Consequently, the friend was summoned to the police station for an interview. Although he appeared nervous, he cooperated with the authorities. He openly admitted his fondness for Sherida and acknowledged driving her around the area on previous occasions. However, he vehemently denied being with her on the night of the murder, claiming that he had picked up his girlfriend from her job at the mall and returned home directly. While his alibi lacked solidity, there was no concrete evidence linking him to the crime, resulting in his eventual clearance. After three months of no new leads, a breakthrough finally occurred. The crime lab successfully extracted a DNA sample from a bodily fluid stain found on Sherida's clothing. Immediately, the police initiated the collection of DNA samples from individuals acquainted with Sherida, hoping to find a match. Additionally, samples were obtained from male suspects. Unfortunately, all these efforts failed to yield a match. Determined to make progress, the detectives took an extra step by running the DNA sample through CODIS, the FBI's national crime database. Once again, this avenue proved fruitless as no match was found. Despite the dwindling leads and the case growing cold, Sherida's parents refused to lose hope. Her father, Harry, persisted in contacting the police every week to stay updated on the case's progress. Even the police officers involved remained dedicated to finding justice for Sherida. In March 2007, a significant breakthrough occurred, four years after Sherida's murder the police made a startling discovery. A new individual had been added to CODIS and their DNA matched the bodily fluid sample found on Sherida's genes. This revelation led them to a 22-year-old man named Warren Dixon, who was previously unknown to anyone involved in the case. Upon further investigation, it was revealed that Warren had attended the same school as Sherida after transferring from Camden High to Pensacon High. Interestingly, Warren, who was 18 at the time of Sherida's murder, had dropped out of school shortly after the tragic event and relocated to Pennsylvania. Two years later, he was arrested on drug charges, which resulted in his details being entered into the CODIS database. Notably, Warren lived just two blocks away from the bridge on 36th Street, indicating his proximity to the crime scene. The police speculated that he may have intercepted Sherida on that fateful night after she left her boyfriend's house. Tracking down Warren was relatively easy for the police, as he had returned to New Jersey and was required to attend weekly probation meetings. 
They approached him during one of these meetings and requested his presence for a police interview. Throughout the questioning, Warren remained outwardly calm, although he seemed to struggle with social interaction. He admitted to knowing Sherida during high school, but claimed to have only learned about her murder through the news. However, when confronted with the presence of his DNA at the crime scene, he confessed to having intimate contact with Sherida on the night of November 28, 2003. The authorities then presented Warren with the hair cap found at the crime scene, without disclosing its origin. Initially, Warren provided evasive answers, but eventually admitted that the hair cap belonged to him. Additionally, Warren displayed an unusual level of interest in the case, constantly posing peculiar questions to the detectives. During a particular moment, he inquired, if I were to unintentionally do this, would I still be required to face imprisonment? In a subsequent interrogation with the police, Warren finally admitted his guilt. He confessed to intercepting Sherida on the night of the murder and making unwanted advances towards her, which she rejected. This led to a violent escalation that tragically resulted in her death. The exact motive behind Warren placing the two plastic bags in Sherida's mouth remained unclear. Despite a lab report in January 2009 that showed no match between Warren's hair and the strands found on the cap, Authorities believed they had sufficient probable cause and evidence to charge him based on his confession. In January 2009, Warren Dixon was apprehended and charged with aggravated manslaughter in a New Jersey Superior Court. During his arraignment, the judge set his bail at $750,000. Sherida Williams' family attended the court proceedings to share their memories of Sherida and display photographs documenting her life from infancy. I want the court to truly understand who she was, to witness her growth, emotionally stated Harry Williams. Warren displayed uncooperative behavior in court, refusing to stand when ordered by the judge and requiring deputies to forcefully remove him from his chair at one point. He remained unresponsive, only answering one question regarding legal representation. The final trial commenced in March 2011. Warren Dixon, 25 years old at the time, pleaded guilty to attempted aggravated assault and aggravated manslaughter. The Williams family was present to witness their daughter finally receive justice after seven long years of sorrow and unanswered inquiries. Sherida's mother and aunt wore buttons adorned with Sherida's image during the court proceedings. On June 3, 2011, Superior Court Judge Samuel Nettle sent his warrant to 20 years in prison specifying that he would only be eligible for parole after serving 85% of this sentence. Additionally, Warren would be subject to lifetime community supervision and listed in New Jersey's Registry of Convicted Sex Offenders. Currently, official records indicate that he is currently incarcerated at East Jersey State Prison and will be eligible for parole in 2026. Following the trial, Harry, Sherida's father, expressed his concern as to why Warren would be granted parole when his daughter was gone forever. He firmly believed that Warren should have received a life sentence instead. Despite his grief, Harry expressed gratitude towards the Camden County Police and the entire community for their efforts in bringing justice. He acknowledged that it was a collective endeavor involving the media, family, prosecutor's office, and friends, and he considered the conclusion of this saga. Throughout the years, Harry developed a connection with Surgeon Martin Wolf from the prosecutor's office, who served as the lead investigator in the case. Whenever Harry reached out to inquire about the case or simply to share his grief, Wolf always paid attention. Wolf dedicated more time to solving this murder than any other case during his 17 years in law enforcement. When Detective John Greer took over the case in 2008 due to Wolf's military deployment, Harry was overcome with emotions. However, Greer remained determined and motivated by the Williams family's unwavering resolve. The family organized annual marches to the 36th Street Bridge, where Sheridan's body was discovered, which served as a source of encouragement for Greer. It was this dedication that ultimately led to the resolution of the cold case. Harry made it a point to contact the Camden County Prosecutor's Office every Monday, seeking answers and requesting meetings ensuring that the tragedy of Sheridan's murder would never be forgotten. In a subsequent interview with the media, Harry directed his message to teenage viewers, emphasizing the importance of not blindly trusting everyone they meet, as hidden motives may exist. 
He described Sherida as a loving and gentle person who trusted everyone and never anticipated anyone would cause her harm. He recalled her reassuring words on the last night she left home, saying, I'm 16 dead, I'll be fine. Pursuing higher education had always been a part of Sherida's aspirations for the future before her life was tragically cut short. To pay tribute to her memory, Pensacola High School bestowed Sherida with a posthumous diploma. The body of a male was found on June 11, 1984, by a farmer in rural Lincoln County, Missouri. The body was discovered inside a pump house near Highway F.A., outside Troy, Missouri. The man was wearing an expensive Bill Blass gray suit with red pinstripes, a winter tie and a cashmere peacoat. An autopsy determined that the man lost his life months before being found. He suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the back of the head. Analysis performed at the time of discovery suggested that these were the remains of an adult male of European ancestry, and he was between 40 and 80 years old. He likely stood between 6 feet to 6 2 inches tall. Unfortunately, investigators were not able to name the victim, let alone the perpetrator, so the case went cold. Then, on March 29, 2023, the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office announced in a press conference that the John Doe had been identified through a DNA match as Jack Langeneckert, a 50-year-old real estate agent who had been living with his wife and son in Florissant, Missouri, when he went missing in 1982. The breakthrough is thanks to forensic genetic genealogy, the increasingly common practice of identifying DNA through comparisons to genetic profiles in genealogy databases. Now that detectives have a name, Captain David Hill said they are working to solve who took Jack's life and how his body ended up on a Lincoln County farm. One of the interesting things about cold cases that are this old is you have to rebuild, Hill said. Who did they hang out with? Who are their friends? Where did they work? What did they do? Authorities believe Jack Langenecker lost his life not long after he went missing in 1982. His car was found a week after his disappearance at the Lambert Airport. Hill said it was too early in the investigation to elaborate more on the details of Jack's disappearance, including why someone may have wanted to hurt him. According to Hill, Jack's family said they filed a missing person report when he went missing, but sheriff's investigators are still trying to find investigative files from the 1982 case. Jack's remains were first tested for DNA in 2015, but lab researchers were not able to find a match in the DNA database, which contains DNA profiles obtained by law enforcement. The Sheriff's Office reopened the case after a Southeast Missouri State University anthropology professor, Dr. Jennifer Benkson, offered in 2021 to help the cold case unit identify human remains. The professor and her advanced students identify which parts of the skeletal remains are best for testing and pay through grants and donations for DNA labs and to do genetic analysis. Othram, a private DNA lab specializing in cold cases, performed the analysis in Jack Langeneckert case. Dr. Jennifer Benkson said, the number of human remains still left unidentified is a tragedy of the scale that most people do not realize. Even though my lab is small, I'm really proud of my students for helping bring answers to these families. Anyone with information on Jack Langeneckert case should contact the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office at 636-528-8546.